Thank you. Are you well? I'm well, thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, are you relaxed? It's, it's not always easy being there, so just uh, let me know. It's called interview anxiety, but I think I am more relaxed this time than last year. <clears throat> uh, okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> um, you started practicing law in 1986. Is that correct? That is correct at the Johannesburg Bar, Chief Justice. Until 2007? Until November 2007, yes. When uh, <coughs> you were appointed a judge of the, uh, of the High Court? That is correct. And you have been a judge for 11 years, four months, more or less? Almost 12 years, if you take the acting... The act, yeah, our, yeah, I meant the permanent judge. Mm. Okay, but with your acting stint, uh, it adds up to your, That brings to me to almost years. 12 years. And for how many terms have you acted in the SCA? I've acted there for seven terms, all in all 18 months. All in all 18 months. Uh, let's start with Johannesburg. Uh, is it easy to survive there as a judge? Chief Justice, one can survive there if you work very hard and very dedicated. Mm. But it is a, an extremely busy division. We are under tremendous pressure. Um, but yes. All things considered, how long should it take an average judge to produce a judgment, a reserve judgment? <clears throat> Chief Justice, <clears throat> I know that, especially in Pretoria and Johannesburg, it is very difficult for colleagues to <clears throat> adhere to the three-month um, norm for judgments to be written. We're struggling in the Constitutional Court too. Yes. Um, and I must tell you, the Johannesburg Bar seems to have worked out the average on which I spent on <clears throat> reserve judgments, which is about a month. But that takes day and night of work, weekends. I have cancelled many holidays with my family. I've worked throughout December, January periods often. Um, so it is really difficult to maintain the three-month um, rule in Johannesburg and Pretoria. If you were to honor your holiday commitments to your family, on average, how long would it take you to complete, um, to deliver a judgment? Well, I would say it would, well, what I've done once was to take it along on holiday. <laughs> and that was also not fair to them. Um, it's not that, that I cancel all the holidays, that I must also, also immediately say. Um, Yes, um, and also, Chief Justice, what I need to add before I answer that question is the work and the documents that we get to prepare, especially full court appeals, are voluminous, and special motions are voluminous. So in between, instead of writing judgments, you have to prepare for the next court hearing, because one cannot walk into a courtroom um, unprepared. My suggestion would have been, not speaking for myself, um, because I'm very experienced <clears throat> um, in judgment writing. I've been on the bench almost 12 years. I've been an advocate for many years. But my suggestion would be to maybe fall back onto the old rule that any judgment of substance uh, must be delivered after the first long recess. In other words, if you reserve a matter of substance, say in March, it must be delivered the first week of August, immediately after the winter six-week recess. Instead of? Instead of the current three months. No, the three months is just uh, designed to encourage us to pursue excellence with all uh with all our, our energies. Uh, that is why you don't get reported to the JCC. 
if your judgment is not finalized yes. in three months, yeah. But if there is such flexibility, so the the rule still stands uh, basically in the judicial code of conduct. Yes. Yeah. And uh, why should you be one of the five? In your own words, as as briefly as you can, without uh, leaving out anything of importance. Chief Justice, yes, I have, as I say, I've um, been an advocate um, 20 years. I've been on the bench almost 12 years. I was in a division as an advocate, which was a very division, very busy division. I had a very busy practice also, a large practice. And also on the bench, I've sat in literally thousands of cases. I've written many, many judgments. <clears throat> I've published in excess of 220 judgments. My judgments are very well received. They are well researched. Um, they are invariably correct. As a permanent judge, I was only overturned once. And <clears throat> there are about four academic articles written on that judgment. Um, where I was perhaps um, a little bit too creative, the Supreme Court of Appeal held that I saw too much in previous judgments of the Supreme Court of Appeal in order to make the jump that I did. Um, I don't know whether many other judges can say that they've only been overturned once as a permanent judge and once as an acting judge. Um, I think what that tells you is that I am in a good position to review other judges' judgments because that is essentially what you do on appeal. You review the judgment in order to decide whether it was correctly decided or incorrectly decided. Um, and especially the Johannesburg Bar Council has written in their comments much about my um, judgment writing skills. President Meyer. Good afternoon. Judge Good afternoon, Mayer. President Good Meyer. Good to see Meyer. you. Good to see you. I'm well, time. thanks. Sorry. I was just saying it's good to see you after a long time. Yes, it's good to see you too, <laughs> President Meyer. Uh, I have just one issue to raise with you, and it relates to comments uh, made by the Black Lawyers Association and the Society of Law Teachers of South Africa who commend you insofar as your judicial work is concerned, the body of judgments you have produced, but uh, note a concern that you may not have done nearly enough, if anything, towards the transformation of the judiciary and the empowerment I beg of your pardon, sorry, Justice Meyer. Oh. Can you hear me now? I hear you better now, yes. All right, I was just saying this bodies, these law bodies, note your good work insofar as um, you know, your judicial duties are concerned, the body of judgments that you have produced, but they also note a concern that you may not have done enough or anything at all to help transform the judiciary or help mentor young and upcoming lawyers. Would you like to comment on Yes, on I would like to comment on that because they actually, in their comment, invited comments from me on that. Um, I've always been involved since I became an advocate in transformation initiatives. And President Maya, you will see that when I was appointed initially as a judge in 2007, I was recommended or nominated by the Johannesburg Bar Council. And that you'll find Annex M, the very last document attached to the questionnaire. We're at the foot of the page. Um, the chairperson of the Johannesburg Bar Council at the time who wrote the letter wrote as follows. Advocate Mayer also actively participated in transformation in initiatives of the Johannesburg Bar, more particularly pupil advocacy training and transformation in initiatives at group level. 
He is a trainer in the pupil advocacy training program and also contributed to the Motion Court Manual for Pupils. In 2004, he investigated and reported a proposed initiative to enable pupil advocates to accept briefs for remuneration. And that indeed was implemented. At present, he is vice chair of the Bridge Group of Advocates. Their transformation program is aimed at redressing the group's racial and gender composition, providing financial support to pupils and newly qualified advocates, and skills transfer and development through the Bridge Group's pupillage support and briefing programs. Um, just to pause there, one of the things that we introduced at the time was what we called the bridge brief. In other words, the more senior advocates, senior juniors and senior advocates, um, would, an attorney would brief the group. And that brief will be then distributed to black people, and youngly um, qualified advocates, and the more senior counsel would then take charge of that brief and ensure that there is excellence going into the preparation and presentation of the case, um, which worked successfully also. So there were many programs that we at the bar already commenced, and you'll notice the Bar Council also refers to it, um, that when I was appointed as a judge, I became very much involved in the training also of magistrates, aspirant judges, newly appointed judges. And um, for the past two years, last year and this year, or uh, since 2017, We've got at the Johannesburg High Court a continuous judicial training <clears throat> um, system where I often, as we call it, facilitate giving lectures on relevant topics um, of law and its practice to my colleagues. And then more recently, since last year, I became involved as a mentor in a mentorship program offered by the South African chapter of the International Association of Women Judges for final year law students at UJ, UNISA, and WITS. And last year in 2018, my mentee was Zinli Mitluli, and <clears throat> she excelled, and that mentorship program involves that you as a judge spends about 40 hours the year with the mentee and you discuss cases before you hear it with the mentee and then after the case once you've made up your mind you discuss it with the mentee again and so the mentee becomes exposed to exactly how a judge is functioning and that I find extremely exciting. You also build up a more long-term relationship with your mentee. Um, the mentee knows that she can contact me um, whenever, and in fact, just as a matter of coincidence, I received an email yesterday afternoon, very late, from my last year mentee, Zinli, in which she tells me that she last Monday obtained a LLB degree and um, she was on the dean, dean's list with two certificates of merit, forensic medicine and critical jurisprudence. And then I quote, I thought I would let you know the good news as the mentorship program certainly contributed to my successful year. And I'm still involved in that program. I got another mentee this year. So yes, I am very much involved in training programs and in being a mentor 
not only to final year female students, but also to colleagues, um, <clears throat> and also in the orientation courses in which I was involved, and also the continuous legal education program offered at the um, Johannesburg High Court. Thank you. Thank you, President Maya. Uh, Commissioner Mbofu. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mbofu. Good, good afternoon, Justice Maya. Um, I just wanted, uh, I'm going to ask you one, one question, hopefully without a follow-up. Yeah. Uh, the, wh one of the comments from Nadel, which does not support your nomination, says, I don't know if you've seen this, it says that the, uh, your judgments, they've read the judgments, and then it says, although his judgments are correct on law, nothing innovative emerges out of his judgments. The SCA is an apex court which must guide the lower courts and develop the jurisprudence of the South African law. The judgments of Mr. Justice Mayor do not meet these requirements. Have you seen that comment? Yes, I've seen that comment. Yes. Well, for what it's worth, uh, I wanted to make it clear. Fortunately, the president of Nadel is here, so I'm sure he'll, uh, yes. <laughs> well, he'll, he'll make the necessary correction. Yes. But uh, my view is that I just wanted to re refer to say that uh, that comment is definitely incorrect in my view. Uh, and I refer to you to the judgment which, of course, uh, I have to commend this judgment because I won in it here. Yeah. <laughs> but um, this judgment is 136 on your papers. Uh, and just to, I'd like you to comment on this because this was a very complex case uh, which involved uh, Section 9 and 10. Gender discrimination was the key issue and uh, racial discrimination as well. Intersected with uh, the Protected Disclosures mm. Act and then the development of Aquilian liability uh, in terms of the common law. I can tell you, for me, it took me more than maybe a month just to plead the case. That's because to the intersection between I know all. it was very complicated. Yes. And um, that judgment, if Nadel had read that judgment, they would have seen that uh, not only did you develop the PDA and, the, and gender and racial discrimination law, but managed to use it in the context of developing the common law, yes. which um, is something that is uh, rare to find. Can you just take us through those types of forward-looking innovative, because they say yes, there's, there's no innovation. For me, that's a definition yes. of, of legal innovation. In fact, that most definitely there, this, um, contrary to what they say, is one good example of where I extended the lecture liability for peer economic loss to include that type of thing. That was a development of the law. And also that comment is in direct contradiction to many of the other judgments and many of the comments also made by the general counsel of the bar and also by the Black Lawyers Association. If you look at the comments of the Johannesburg Bar at page 2, paragraph 4.1, where they said the candidate has a wide knowledge, wide knowledge of the law and has produced judgments on a wide range of areas of law. His judgments are clear, well-reasoned, and comprehensively researched. He displays sensitivity towards vulnerable groups and issues. He has developed the law pertaining to the rights of children in terms of the A Convention on the civil aspects of the international child abduction. He has also developed the law pertaining to the maximum period of detention of illegal immigrants pending deportation. Then they go on as to how I developed the <coughs> um, law, environmental law, in the Harmony case, um, which is considered to be one of the major judgments that I've ever written. And then paragraph 4.7 at page 4, 
yeah, no, 4.7 comes to the conclusion uh, that the harmony judgment demonstrates a welcome, purposive approach to the interpretation of environmental legislation which promotes the rights concerning the environment, reflecting the values of the Constitution. And then finally, paragraph 7.5, where the Bar, uh, um, General Bar Council comes to the following conclusions. His judgments as a judge of the Johannesburg High Court and as an acting judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal cover a wide area of the law and serve as an indication that the candidate has a creative legal mind and is not inhibited in finding innovative solutions to legal problems. And indeed, Mr. Mopofu, if you also read many of the academic articles, references made to some of them uh, by myself in the questionnaire, and also by the Demogra uh, Democratic Governance and Rights Unit, DGRU, um, where they deal with certain of my major um, judgments and where I've certainly developed various areas of the law. So. Um, I was surprised when I read that comment. Okay. And I find it somewhat contradictory because in order to write a judgment that is considered to be correct, one must invariably be innovative. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, for the record, the case I was referring to is Chowen versus Associated Motor Holdings, otherwise known as the Lamberti case that involved uh, uh, yes. Gender discrimination. Thank, thank you, CJ. Thank you, Commissioner Mbofu. Uh, Commissioner Singh. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner Singh. No, uh, Chief Justice, I've been partly covered by Commissioner Mbofu, because I was trying to understand this innovative part in the Nadal document. When I read the, uh, the judgment on how many gold mining versus the regional director, I found it was quite innovative and quite brave. To, to come up with that judgment, because acid mine drainage, to treat acid mine drainage in South Africa, could cost anything up to 15 billion run. It's a serious problem. So I, I thought it was an innovative judgment, but I think we've had an answer to that question. So I'll cover it. Thank you. Thank you, Th Commissioner Singh. Thank you, Commissioner Singh. You're excused, Judge Meyer. Am I excused? Yes. Thank you, Chief Justice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioners.